Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None accepted. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are chock full of that, man. Damn right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. If you're going to blitz, come strong, but don't come at all. Coming strong with another edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns 24-7. I am Jeff Howe. We, we've got, uh, what, less than just over a week until camp starts? Yeah. Got week, NFL I mean, training camps going on right now. 39 days officially, I believe, until Texas football. This is actually the – we had 38, I think, as of today. Is right? it 38, 38 today? 38 as of today, It's yes. the last – I believe the, we've had the last week, though, without football in some regard. So you'll have – so either some the preseason football, Hall of Fame game, football. I think is next weekend. Wow! Yeah, for the next weekend until the end of football season. That used to always signify the end of summer. I was so yeah. happy as a kid that Hall of Football's here, but then I was like, man, I mean, school starts in a week, so it was an odd like predicament <laughs> to be put in. Yeah, yeah that's what makes, that's what makes <laughs> August like one of the worst months of the year. Like football's not really here here yet, and like school starts and oh, it's here. Because don't the high school and high school football yeah, start, start for there us, two for, days? For us, us, you know, that we're in it, Rod. Like, we yeah. know it's like here, that's, to me, that's, no, yeah. I still remember that. So, even though in Texas, it's hot as, man, it's hot as hell. So, <laughs> I wonder what they're doing about so that. I think, I think July might be the worst month of the year. Um, yeah, man, it is. Because there, there's no football. Yeah. All you got is baseball. Yeah. It's hot. Like, we're at that point in time in the year in Texas where it's it's too hot to, like, those walk outside. Do anything. Yeah, yeah, you can't even take the dogs outside. You go or to something. Barton Springs, man. That's about it. Yeah, like it's yeah. It's, you go it's fall a, in the water. It's oppressive and depressing, yeah. actually, a little bit, no doubt. Well, yeah. we'll hopefully break you out of the doldrums here on this week's edition of the Blitz. Let me bring in the rest of the team. He's the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, Matt Butler. Matt, uh, you studying it? I know you like the severe weather trends. You studying any of this heat we've got going on? In <laughs> not really. Not into the studying of the because <laughs> it's just like Rudd said. It is just oppressive every single day. The exact same thing. But it's oh, been uh, it's pretty interesting seeing some of the stuff across the country. Like the East Coast getting insane floods, all sorts of stuff. I've been doing a little bit more baseball research and seeing how much the weather just fluctuating all across America. Straight up nuts. Have you guys put this app on your phone? My wife made me put this on my phone. It's called the What the Forecast app. <laughs> what the Forecast? It's pretty good. Like Brandon. Yeah. You open bad. it, and it'll tell you stuff like this. Like right now in Austin, mostly sunny, 94 degrees, and the message on the screen is, the sun hates your face and is determined to give you wrinkles. The sun is a complete <laughs> a-hole. Yes. I like it. It's a millennial weather machine. You yeah. can just wake it up and get a laugh. It's That's like your weather horse. That's what I've been waiting for for years. Like when I watch the, the you know, our regular you know, nightly news forecast in respect to Mm-hmm. With Jim Spencer and everybody yeah. out there doing it in ATX. What are you going to tell me other than it's hot it's yesterday? Hot. It's hot today. Guess what? It's going to be hot tomorrow. It's hot as hell as that. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. No, it, it got when it got to 109 degrees or whatever mm-hmm. it was the other day. Yeah, like that. Uh, that's that's shocking, dude. Like that's that's uh, it, it, you actually feel like you're baking when you go outside. You probably are actually. I like, actually had a friend get bacon. third degree burns on his body from sunburn because he's somebody that Yeah, no I'm serious, man. And I'm not yeah. joking like uh-huh. I don't think I've ever seen him wear what? shorts except for one time when we were 18, he bought a kayak, went fishing on Lake Bastrop, and his wife wasn't exaggerating. She's like, "I'm going to have to take him in to get treatment like hospital. He had third degree burns for like 7 days on his legs." Yeah, white folks, y'all got to watch out, man. Uh, <laughs> Insane. Seriously, y'all need to watch out. It's sunscreen, don't be too proud. No, yeah, Carry for it sure. With you. Yeah. Uh, you get that kind of advice from the third member of our team. He's a renaissance man here <laughs> White on the <this> show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, okay, that's me being <laughs> no, you are right, man. To white people. They, you are right. It's that, it's that, real, that, it's that yeah. real raw advice you get from uh, our lockdown corner here on the show. Lifetime Longhorn, 2002 UT All-American. 2002 semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award, fourth-round draft choice of the New York Giants back in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the CFO, who no longer. Oh, man, I know it hurt my heart. No longer the traded team Johnny. Johnny. Manziel. Yeah, that's upset me. Now that's, with the Montreal Alouettes. 
That's all right. Well, you I've know been watching, play there. I've been watching way too much CFL the He's last play. couple weeks. Mike, Mike Sherman, Sherman is the head coach yeah. there. There you go. He's gonna, it's awesome. They're going to start it up again, baby. I mean, the Aggies were everywhere in the news. It was 2012 all over again. It was Josh Gordon was in the news while Johnny Manziel was being traded to Mike Sherman. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Johnny Manziel stuck in Canada, but Robbie got himself out of Canada. And when he did, he got himself back to Austin, Texas, and 40 acres where he earned his degree. If he knew where his T-ring was or had one, he would wear it proudly. Nevertheless, he is a card-carrying member of DBU. Number 21 in your program, but number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. And Rod, uh, we left off last week talking about Big 12 Media Days and some of the uh, fallouts, the right word you want to use, with some of the residual yeah. news notes and nuggets coming out of that. Uh, coaching school was this last Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Texas High School Coach Association Convention down in San Antonio, and I was telling the guys uh, I was sitting in on Herb Hand's offensive line lecture, and yeah, but that four. was good. I went, brought the legal pad with me, it's like so football you know, porn. So Rod, Rod knows anytime I break the legal pad out, I'm doing like this has got all my it's bust, hardcore my research, bust rate, my bust rate info, and mm-hmm. Todd Orlando notes from last summer. Nice. Um, Told wife, you like don't touch my pads, baby. I love yeah. it. Don't, <laughs> don't touch my. You damn can pads. throw away my baseball, American throw away everything, yes. books, whatever. Don't touch these. Old pads. media guides on the shelf. <laughs> don't touch the legal pads. <laughs> Stuff in there I need. Um, but anyway, so we'll go over some of that. Uh, I want to get to this, though, and I, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, um, but it's watch list time. So I right. just want to run down some of the guys that are on watch lists and see if uh, any of it catches you guys. I think the uh, the Ray Guy Award watch list and the <laughs> Luke Groza Award watch list came out today. Don't expect any I, I – no, no Longhorns are on no, the Ray Guy list. I don't expect of anybody Dixon to be on the list. Ryan Bujewski? Is it that Ryan Bujewski. He's Dixon's cousin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we had yesterday uh, the Football Writers Association of America, which uh, I'm a member of. I pay my dues every year. Uh, Chris Boyd on the watch list for the Bronco Nagurski Award. Uh, Patrick Vahe is on the watch list for the Outland Trophy, which goes to the nation's top interior lineman. Uh, Bronco Nagurski awarded the Defensive Player of the Year in college football. Uh, Derek Johnson, Brian Arakpo both won that. Malcolm Brown was a finalist in 2014. Chris Boyd also on the watch list for the Jim Thorpe Award. Rod, you were a Jim Thorpe Award watch list member mm-hmm. once upon a time. Made that semifinal cut back way, in 02. Way, way, way back in the day. Troy Palomalu, Mike Doss, Terrence Newman. No, that's yeah. the real the semifinalists. That's what when they get it down to like six to ten, like yeah, somewhere, like somewhere around there, Maybe, yeah, 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 yeah something like stuff. that. Uh, so other guys that are on the watch list, Brecken Hager and Gary Johnson for the Chuck Bednarik Award. Uh, Gary Johnson also on the watch list for the Buckus Award. Colin Johnson is on the watch list for the Boletnikoff Award. Andrew Beck makes the watch list for the John Mackey Award, goes to the nation's top tight end. That's- and Zach Shackelford, uh, a, f- a watch list member for the Remington Trophy, which goes to the nation's top center. Rod B., if I had to hmm. p- pin you down and say one of these guys will be a semifinalist for one of these awards, that they are nominated for, and maybe he could even be a finalist. Which wow. of these guys do you think makes it that far? Uh, that's good. That's a great question. I'm going to go with Chris Boyd probably right now. For the Jim Thorpe Award? Yeah. Uh, Chris Boyd probably ended the season playing as well, if not better, than Houghton Hill was playing when he was at the top of his game last year before he was suspended. So and I'm looking at it. I mean, the offensive guys – it's it's gonna be tough for them to get a lot of love. Mm-hmm. We have some, so many question marks on offense. Right. The white Colin Johnson, I love him. I think he's great. I think you look at a lot of mock drafts for twenty nineteen. How they got him being a potential first rounder in multiple mock drafts that I've seen. Not yeah. that they even matter, but it tells you about the projection for him. Um, he was what less than three hundred yards last year away from getting to a thousand yards. Mm-hmm. He could be that guy for Texas, uh, but the offense would have to make so many strides for him to be. I would think in terms of a, a perennial playmaker in, in, in terms of national having that type of national impact so offensive guy even the offensive lineman i mean yeah, we we still don't know that's a work in progress herb right. hand i think he's great so so many question marks there gary johnson i do like him but i think the big 12 the disrespect people have for defense in the big 12 mm-hmm. i think that'll hurt him because he's kind of tailor-made for the big 12 an undersized speedy guy yeah. that can be physical yeah. as an inside linebacker i don't know if he'll get a lot of love nationally i think he'll have pretty good stats though I think he can yeah, can, I, can I interject real quick, yeah. though, Rod, on that? Because uh, there's a thread on, on the message board, and uh, I forget what thread it was in, but there's a, all kinds of discussion going on right now on the flagship message board of Horns 24-7. But uh, I wrote an article about Gary Johnson, uh, just kind of like with some of the guys talking about him. You know, Chris Nelson talked about a guy that 
uh, Gary Johnson being a guy that really opened the eyes because when he got to Texas from junior college, he was blown away, and I've talked about this before. He was blown away by, hey, you guys, you know, get three meals a day and yeah. comfortable beds and all this stuff. Man, this Moving is great. And Chris up. Nelson said it kind of opened your eyes to like, wow, we this yeah. is kind of some luxury stuff that yeah. that we've got going on here as yeah. I break the break the chair. Yeah, I'm no, no. Um, I agree with that. But uh, he's hungry. Yeah, and, and it's hungry. that that hunger he's and, hungry, and, and you know you look Set at all the other stuff he brings to the table mm-hmm. and and it last gets to that ch- last chance you kind of hungry. Right, <laughs> and and in that thread, somebody asked me, you know, about just the difference between Big 12 linebackers and SEC linebackers. And, I, I, Rod, I, I agree with you, and you yeah. kind of opened my eyes to this. You know, guys like Jordan Hicks and Malik Jefferson, while, while they're great players, and we're on their great players, uh, you don't need those type of linebackers to be successful in the Big 12. And I don't mm. want this to sound like a slight to Gary Johnson either, no. but, you know, Gary Patterson at TCU has proven – in this league, if you can be dominant up front and you can be really good on the back end, yeah. the guys in the middle, you can really kind of tailor make them to whatever you want to be. You don't exactly. need like the guy that can be sideline to sideline. Yeah. You can just put a couple of skill athletes there because Rod, the, the, the traditional way you think about traditional defense is whether you're three, four, four, three. That Sam linebacker seems to be the position that's really kind of out against the spread offense because you don't need a guy that just plays over the tight end to smash the tight end. Now you need a nickelback or you need you need, you need yeah. a linebacker like a Jason Hall type guy. Like Jason yeah. Hall Hybrid. is almost like the perfect Big 12 him. linebacker. So that's mm-hmm. why I said yeah. like Gary Johnson, people worry about his size, but man, at 225, 230 with his physicality and his speed and athleticism, Gary Johnson really is the perfect Big 12 linebacker. He really yes. is. Yeah, especially if you're going to be utilizing that lightning package that you utilized last year. So I agree with you, too. And, you know, I don't know how that really translates to the NFL. I think that's a different discussion altogether. But in the Big 12 culture, I hmm. do. I think he'll be really, perfect. really productive. Even when, when uh, Malik Jefferson was out in the bowl game, I think he got 10 tackles in that mm-hmm. game. I mean, he was extremely productive. And so I think Todd Orlando will utilize him like that. But I don't think he'll get the national respect. No. I think Chris Boyd could get the national respect because he ended the, the season hot. And in Big 12, he'll get plenty of opportunities to make plays on the ball. And that and, and DBU helps him out a little bit, too, the reputation that Texas mm-hmm. has on defense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think he right now, Andrew Beck, no, he won't get enough love or respect. I think he won't even be the – I won't even, I don't think he'll be the marquee tight end or even in the, the, the top two of the rotation of tight ends by midseason. I think it'll be Reese Laytow and Cade Brewer anyway. Yeah, and hit, with him being on that list, it just made me wonder, okay, what is uh, the whole state of tight ends across the country? Is this more telling of that, that there aren't many, or is Andrew Beck actually considered to be one of the better ones out there? That'll be telling to see where it goes. And then also, though, yeah. if you look at the, which players, like I agree totally on Colin Johnson being the great prospect, but when you look at the depth and the, it, when you look at the way they win those awards and how you need so many numbers, that's normally going to go. If you happen to be like the perfect setup with Shipley and Quan, when you have two receivers and they're going to get all the dispersion, you aren't going to get that with any of these Texas receivers, even if they right. do perform well. Unless like Colin Johnson, double-digit TD still doesn't get you anything. But when you look at like the DBs and the d line. And that's where in the Big 12, you look at the culture of the conference. If you get a guy that's a high sack maker or those pressures are allowing somebody to get big turnovers because there is more of a chance situation with turnovers to where if Gary Johnson's the benefactor or Chris Boyd's the benefactor, they yeah. can actually maybe nationally because those rewards come down to numbers. In the Big 12, only way you can get numbers is if you're a big time receiver or if you're stopping all the pass. And so you get a lot of pass rush numbers or you get a lot of, you know, back end numbers. So those are the areas that might have a chance to win those awards. That's true, because we got Brecken Hagel's a natural pass rusher. Yeah. He can be like, I, was Sack compa- I compared him last, uh, oh, I don't know, last show maybe, to J- Jackson Jeffcoat. Very, very similar pass to Jeffcoat. Well, they're just pa- they're natural pass rushers. They both have pedigree. They, for different reasons, they didn't play enough their, during their early years on the 40 acres in 2013, Jackson Jeffco breaks out. Mm-hmm. That's his unbelievable season 13 sacks and 22 tackles for loss. Mm-hmm. Big 12 defensive player of the year is an All American. And it was like, damn, I know he was good, but I didn't know he was like that good. Won the Ted Hendricks Award yeah. as the nation's top defense. Right? He's Hendricks. actually second in the CFL right now in, in sacks. I he's saw like, somebody so tweet he's that. A, he's a, and Jeff he was in the NFL when he, played, when he played in the NFL. He actually got to the quarterback. Like, go wild. Yeah, with he Washington, just, yeah. He became a liability because he was just too small because and he was the, a hybrid to, guy. To Matt's but, point, yeah, to Matt's point, the NFL, they're like, well, he looks like a Sam linebacker. Like, that's what his body profile is, but that's not that's where not you need to use set. him. Yeah, right. and Brecken Hager is very much like that. He's a hybrid guy 
they you know called him a tweener at first, but he he could have that type of breakout season that Jackson Jeffcoat had in 2013 this year. He's in a perfect position to remember all the pass rushers Jeffcoat had around him. Right, mm-hmm. that was the age of I don't know if Reed and Okafor were still on campus with him then, but they had 13 was mm-hmm. said Reed, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Like they, he still had help. He had other guys around him where you couldn't just strictly, um, you know, double team him and chip him all the time. You had other threats to right. worry about. Um, and you got Malcolm Roach, you got Charles Amenahu. I think it's setting up for that kind of year for Brecken Hager, and now I think Todd Orlando is going to use him like that. So I agree with you, Matt. He he could be maybe second behind Chris Boyd, in my opinion, to, to what? make that semifinal list. Uh, a couple things, uh, Matt. We're, t- we're talking about you know how the NFL looks at linebackers, and I'm not saying this Gary Johnson is going to be a top ten pick like this guy, but when you look <laughs> at combine measurables, Roquan Smith was six one two thirty six. Yeah. So the NFL is maybe – it's like we talked about at some point, the NFL is going to have to drop the ego and say, look, this is what the college game is giving us. We have to change what we do to make the pieces fit rather than trying to constantly what? stick square pegs in round holes and, and, and pay first-round picks money when we don't really know what to do with them. A lot of respect to the SEC helped him out too, though. Right. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's um, why I get to that get respect tight. I about mean, the defensive yeah, coaches. Like, right. oh, Georgia linebacker, but you're right. It could be similar production somewhere else and not get that Yeah, yeah that's why I was thinking that's five years later, Alec Ogletree. It's the exact same body type and style. Yeah. Um, and then to y'all's point about wide receivers and the numbers you're talking about, I go back to 2014. John Harris, 68 catches, 1,051 yards, seven touchdowns, didn't even make the semifinalist list. Yeah, like, not gonna get wasn't, them. wasn't even a first team All Big 12 player, was second team on the AP team, and yeah. with a coach's team was an honorable mention choice. You, you know, need like 1,800 yards receiving to be on that yeah, list the, these days. It's the Big absurd. 12 has had most of the Bolitnikoff winners in the last, what, six, seven years anyway, uh-huh. and those guys' numbers are absurd. Oh, that man, State, just, Oklahoma what? State's had like four of them. Yeah, like Justin yeah. Blackman's numbers are just freakish. You yeah. know what I mean? Like Matt said, like, you're talking about guys who get numbers that Didn't are like Wilt Chamberlain. He set the school record with 1490 yeah, and he lost Eric Decker. Yeah, yeah, yeah Ship got robbed that yes, year. Golden Tate, and Eric Barry, Golden, Tate and Eric Barry, Golden Tate and Eric Barry have awards that That's Jordan Shipley and Earl Thomas should have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree with I don't that. want to sound like a big homer, but... Hell, I think Sam well, Bradford may have a Heisman that Texas should have had. That's the year Colin the Johnson's 08, helped. Yeah, pre-season. somebody believes that. that, that Man, we been, can, yeah. dude, that's the year he should have won. And I, I, yeah, there's no doubt I agree about with you it. 100%. That's, 2008 was the year. People talk yeah. about 09, but 08 was the year. Cole that Cole number, yeah. Mm-hmm. Going the stats and everything. Honestly, I don't even know what they could have looked at. Completed if seven, he had any hype before him, yeah. he would have. Completed 77% of his passes. 77% of his passes. Mm-hmm. Like, like I was hard to do against <laughs> air, you know what? Like what are y'all looking at? This guy, guy's the Heisman winner. I uh, I thought it was a no brainer going in. I was actually shocked. And let his let his that. team in rushing yards. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. yeah. I, was, dude, yeah. I thought it was a no brainer. I was like, that's a no brainer. And he beat him head up. But yeah. it's all because like, of the no brainer. Pr- all because of preseason. Like oh, coming man. in though, that and was, then Tebow yeah. cried that year. Tebow cried that year was big, and then Bradford. <laughs> well, still, I don't uh, know. But anyway, anyway yeah. hopefully we're having anyway. legitimate Heisman discussions here in the next few that years. That would be and, great. And there are going to be Colt about. McCoy and Shipley discussions for 100 years. Not just talking about watch lists. <laughs> but, uh, Rod, um, actually, you know what? I, I do want to look at something, though, speaking of 2008, now that you guys bring it up. Um, the 08 game's always on TV. <clears throat> Brad Crawford, who does a phenomenal job at 24-7 sports, uh, one of our national college football guys, uh, always coming up with great content. Brad put out a list, of, uh, and I'm trying to find it right now, but it was basically the best, the best teams of the BCS slash college football playoff era to not win a national championship. Oh, and yeah. 2008 Texas. Yep. he had a number seven. I can see that. Um, it probably could be even higher than that. Should be. Yeah. I believe ranked ahead, and I'm I'm sorry for not being prepared for this, yeah. but I believe he actually ranked them ahead of. That 08 Oklahoma team that played for uh, yeah. the national title. Yep. Uh, I can believe that. Well, because no doubt. We, we all thought they were better. It's just, damn. Damn you, Crabtree. I still sit around and, and yeah. like, because they've showed that 08 Texas OU game all the time. And when I watch it, I still think, like, I love that 05 team, but I don't know. The way the 08 always executed almost, like, perfectly one in a clutch really game was, situation. Yeah. Yeah. It was okay, like, so, um, that game, that team hit their maximum 100% almost every single game, which is why I would almost take them over the VY um, team. On Brad's list, uh, Oklahoma from 2008 came in at number 11, and Texas was, 2008 Texas was number 7. No, that 08 team beats the 09 team any and, day, all day. And, and they beat can, that 09 yeah, team. Yeah, and can I just read you the explanation? Yeah. Brad makes a great point. Uh, what could have been for quarterback Colt McCoy in the 2008 Longhorns, one of the biggest wins in Texas Tech history, resulted in the program's only loss, a walk-off 39-33 setback on a coverage bus, resulting in Michael Crabtree's touchdown oh. grab from Graham Harrell. It marked the Red Raiders' arrival moment nationally under Mike Leach and cal- catapulted Texas Tech from number six to number two in the polls the following week. 
Texas, they'd finished 11 and 2. Uh, Texas Tech, they'd finished 11 and 2 while Texas won its final four games and ended the season at number 3 in the final poll. McCoy was superb as a junior throwing for a career best 3859 yards and 34 touchdowns and a 76.7% completion percentage. Texas 2009 squad was elite the following season but navigated a somewhat favorable schedule before seeing its 17-game winning streak end against Alabama in the BCS championship game. The 2018 beat four top 11 teams while the 2009 Longhorns didn't beat any. And that yeah. gauntlet of a schedule that went from the Oklahoma yeah. to the Missouri, Missouri blowout here to the Oklahoma State, Oklahoma State to here Tech. to then the finally have the loss. And the craziest thing about 08 is Colts yards per attempt. It's one of the most indicative stats in the NFL fell of a quarterback that is performing very well the rest of his career is like in 09 seven and a half but in 08 9.7 average air yards per attempt it's insane he uh and i gotta say that 2008 2009 that is when the big 12 is at its zenith that is the yeah. best the big 12 has ever been and most competitive the big 12 has ever mm-hmm. been so it's 08 09 years actually that 09 years you could argue the big 12 that's the best defense that the big 12 had ever seen too that's when nebraska is playing like the best defense Masu. in the country with Nadama Kungsu. Go look at all the guys they put in the league. From Gerald McCoy, I believe, mm-hmm. is right. The Oklahoma. The, at he Oklahoma. Was on- Earl Thomas coming out of Texas back then. Oh, Oklahoma I mean, State was full of players. You got, I mean, you talk about a ton of like really good defense. I'm talking about like, all, I mean, you talk about top, I don't know, top 10 drafted defensive mm-hmm. players in the NFL and some of the best defensive players still in the NFL that came out of the Big 12. That was the best. R- really, Rod, right, if, you, if, you, if you want to look at it, really. 08, 09. And I take well, the Aggies out and Missouri out. Missouri Missouri had a yeah. first round defensive tackle every year. And hell, I well, did that, nothing. Uh, that's a uh, hell. Von Miller was. Well, yeah. I take. When, when was Von Miller drafted? He was two, right around Johnny two, Manziel, 2010, but he committed then. Yeah. So he was later. Okay. Um, I take nothing away from uh, take nothing away from Texas winning national championship in two thousand five. But really, if you want to talk about the kind of the peak years of the Big Twelve, yeah. it's really seven, eight, and nine. Because look at two thousand seven. You had four teams from the conference finish in the top ten in the final polls. Missouri was fourth. Sucks. Kansas was seventh. They won the, they won the Orange Bowl that year. Yeah. Oklahoma Maybe, finished you know. eighth, and Texas finished tenth at ten and three after beating Arizona State in the Holiday Bowl. And Texas Tech was a nine win team that finished uh, that finished twenty. Yeah, and, 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 and then sure. so look at what is the what e, what initially is the downfall of the Big Twelve, where it, it it doesn't compete consistently at a national level. If the last time they had great defense was the last time the Big Twelve was a perennial power. A powerhouse, mm-hmm. period, pretty much. Uh, other than that, 09 is when it stops, right? That's when the Dumb Kungsu and all those guys mm-hmm. leaving their drafted. Must Texas Champ has the downfall 10. in 2010. Must Champ leaves. Then after that, the defensive de- deterioration and decay in the Big 12. Cons- it's just, you know, right right now, right. I think it's it's rampant. Like it's, it's when Oklahoma right now, transforms. It, it, it determines the culture of the Big 12. And although a great offensive culture, it's hard for the Big 12 to get into the college football playoff year after year and even harder for them to get into the, the championship game. As a matter of fact, they haven't been in a championship game since, since Texas. Texas. Yeah. No nine. And they you know think I mean? back like, to like that's what? not a coincidence, people. Like no. that's not that's not a coincidence. Until you play championship level defense, you will not play in a national title. And Texas has to be thinking, and so is Oklahoma too. And this is the first year they didn't have a person that was on the preseason all Big Twelve defensive team since like nineteen ninety nine. It's been a long, long time. That would have been Bob Stoops' first year. Yeah, no, you know what I mean? Say, since Bob that Stoops happened. Had the and zone. you go look at all the teams that have been able to win national titles, they're all top ten defenses. Like it's just you know, I think uh that Auburn Cam Newton team wasn't a top ten defense. They had Nick that Fairley, LSU though. team that uh Les Miles's the championship was weird. I think there was two losses. They weren't a top oh, ten seven. defense. Uh, I think um, – I'm trying to think. There, there are very few. There are only like a few exceptions in the last 10 to 15 years where a, a team won the national title without a top-10 defense. Right. That's just the way it is. Texas, the last time Texas had a top-10 defense, 05. Yeah. Last time they had a top-20 defense, uh, then you got to go back to 0, oh, 09. I was about to say 08 or 09 it's would 09. be close. Yeah, that's because of it the ain't, culture. It, it, ain't, it ain't rocket science, man. Like, it's just that simple. That's why uh, Todd Orlando might be the most important well, I think that's what ran it, Bob Stoops out because that was an no. Oklahoma was what you thought of tough defense from the early 2000s. Yeah. And, like, that was all their identity was. And it slowly, like, sold his soul to the other side. And it was weird when you saw those Bradford teams and then there forward, they realized the culture of the conference, where is it going? He had to find a way to compete and then, you know, defense across the whole conference has went by the way. Oh, Ohio State 2014 is the other team okay. that won a Herman. national title without a top 10 defense. Clemson was num- top was number 11. Talking about scoring defense okay. in 2016. But um, 
just running down some. I just want to run down some of these records. I just ran through 2007 in the Big 12, 2008, Oklahoma 12 and 2, Texas 12 and 1, Texas Tech 11 and 2, Oklahoma State was 9 and 4, Missouri was 10 and 4. Uh, then 2009, Nebraska 10 and 4, yeah. Texas 13 and 1, Oklahoma State 9 and 4, Texas Tech 9 and 4. Teams playing defense though. Nebraska's yeah. playing good defense. Go look at Missouri back in the day. Missouri's playing good defense. needs to line stop line. showing that 2009 Big 12 championship game. Like make it like a mm-hmm. like a five minute deal and just show like the field goal at the very end. Because yeah. the re- trust me, the stuff in the middle as a Texas fan, that's not stuff that's exactly memorable. Yeah. Or just yet. show defensive highlights. Like don't show. Don't show much champs guys going away. Don't show anything offensive related. Yeah. That's why the 2010 Nebraska game was so much fun to watch on TV, too. It was absurd. I was like, why are they showing this game? I go, go Gary, yeah. Gerber, go. That was, that, OA season was a, that was a fun season to be a Longhorn football fan. It really was. Back then, though, you also remember houses. you had the North and South, and then yeah. you sometimes would benefit, benefit from playing the weaker teams from the other side, and you only had eight conference games to nine. Well, so that's... nowadays the nine's going to have a built-in five more losses yeah. for the conference just <laughs> mathematically – no matter what. Missouri fans will tell you that's how Kansas won 12 games in 2007 because they had no, a schedule Texas where they didn't, they didn't face Texas or Oklahoma that There you go. But uh, anyway. SEC, that can happen to you in an easy but, SEC year. But, you know, Rod, that's a credit to Todd Orlando, and I'll throw Gary Patterson in there as well now that yeah, no TCU's back that to that playing defense. Because, you, know. you know what we didn't hear last year when, when Texas was rolling defensively? We didn't hear any rhetoric coming from the 40 about, well, you got to change the the standard by which good defenses are measured in this league, and tackling's a problem all across America. All across and, America, that's the you know, epidemic. These spread the offenses, which, nobody's figured it out yet. Which may not necessarily been wrong, but I don't know if you, you got to deal with it. Up. Everybody's dealing with it, and so why are we talking about it? There you right. go. Everybody's dealing We're with it. We're all getting the same players from high school. Yeah. yeah. But that's that's one thing I wanted to talk about, though, Rod. And I know this is the time of year where we're at the tail end of off-season conversations, which you're getting down to the nitty-gritty because you really run over everything else to talk about. Like, there's debates <laughs> on our board right now of, well, who yeah. should be in that joker role in the dime package? And could you put Gary Johnson <laughs> out there? Like, right, right, and we're we getting we're getting real. And, I, I mean, yeah. I've gone on rants about, hey, Texas doesn't have a backup center. Like, what are they going to do for backup center in camp? Yeah. I'm like, okay, I just need to slow myself down. slow down. They'll probably yeah. figure that out. Yeah. But it's a case <laughs> of – not getting sleep. It's oh, a case true. of maybe not, <laughs> not – sometimes not seeing the forest <laughs> through the trees. And I say that because Tom Herman brought up this during his press conference at, at coaching school, which I, I was the only guy in the Texas beat who was there. I don't know why, but I just you're I, a good I, beat I go, I go you every like, year. You like, you like football porn too. Though. I go every year, and uh, well, I, I was actually going because I thought it was going to be coordinators because last year it was coordinators. So I was like, well, we haven't heard from Tim Beck and Todd Orlando since spring ball, so I figured that'd be good. But it was Tom Herman, which was. Great. Anyway, it's didn't better. Yeah, uh, definitely no issue with Tom that. Tom Harmon would rather be talking ball than answer questions about Deshaun Elliott and stuff like he that. He was asked about Deshaun Elliott, and Deshaun Elliott deal. That's it. Point. Seems like that <laughs> issue's dead. But yeah, yeah. It was, and uh, and we're talking about defense and and scheme. And he said, you know, he said before we start talking about you know nickel packages and dime packages and things like that, he pointed out two things that I don't think a should get lost about last year's defense and b should be the foundation of why you think this defense is going to be really good this year is they played really hard defensively. Like, Rod, stuff you talk about, party at the football, rally the football, run of the football, 11 hats on the football, like the stuff that kind of gets corny that defensive coaches preach, this defense did it last year, and that was one of the best yep. tackling Texas defenses I've seen in We've a ever, very long time. I was going to say that I've ever seen. And you know, not that I've been watching it for right. 35 years, but I, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to find. Have. Well, I mean, I, it, it was as good a tackling team as some of the teams that I was on, and hell, I was on top ten defenses. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like that was a that, that was a sound football team, and I agree with you. It sounds cheesy, but we used to have the party at the football. I don't know what they call it now, but it's like it's a party at the football. Everybody's invited, and you know, we would watch and see if how many people were in the picture, like mm-hmm. near the ball. Like that was the whole point, and coach would yell at guys that weren't around the ball. That was kind of that was up to you. Even if it, if you were you know being run on a post route or something, you notice a run play, find the football. And you're right, guys rallied. That's the reason that a lot of the balls bounced in their favor. That's a lot of yeah. reason they were able to run. You know, get a lot of return touchdowns is because they're rallying to the football. Oh, oh, he's got it. Oh, let's go. Oh, well, you know what I mean? Like it was. So it was fun to watch. I mean, they did. I I saw a lot of they used to call it the. Uh, and Matt probably knows about the Touchy Philly Index. Mm-hmm. Dirk, uh, Dirk. Yeah, during Dirk Nowitzki's uh, championship with the Mavs, they noticed that the Mavs 
had more like high fives and more. They had more PDA basically. Mm. Yeah. They showed each other more love. Like they celebrated together. They were having more fun together through, through like the first three or four games. They I think they had a touchy Philly index that was like ten. Uh, uh, I don't know. It's probably five times more than the the Miami Heat, even though they were a superstar team. And I noticed that on the defense. They partied together. They had the touchy Philly index working. They seemed like they enjoyed playing together. Yeah. So and I and I for a team that was in a new system. That was staggered, like yeah. how successful they and how comfortable right. they all looked in that new system. Watching yeah. back on some of y'all's old games, it was the North Carolina Texas game, and then one of the other ones that I was watching this past summer, and uh, it was you could see that actually, like you could see the intent, like literally there would be five or six stormtrooper oh, jerseys just coming going flying to party. in and go get yeah. in. Watch them on the Corey Redding when the y'all are all chasing him into the end zone afterward and on the back or on the front flip play just to go celebrate. Like you can see that type of just energy, and like it's the same thing that I heard when Boris DL talked about what drew him to to go play for the Spurs and then what he brought to the Utah team that was able to grow together. And it was this idea that, no, it's like, I know I'm not passing him the ball to shoot. I'm just passing him the ball because if you touch the ball, you're engaged. And then now exactly. your mind is you're triggered. Invested. Now there's a reset and then you do that. Now if you all are doing that, it isn't as if you're lazy just standing there without the ball. It's human nature that you aren't focused because you aren't focused on the ball every split mm-hmm. second. And just that idea of being engaged really can become a momentum that you play together with that energy. It's yeah. amazing, though, Rod, when you look at this defense last year, and I know I've talked about this before, but I think it bears repeating, of it's it's crazy to go out to practice and see stuff that happens during individual and when they're just doing stuff on air and the, the techniques and the things these coaches focus on. And then to see that get carried over to the field makes you feel like, wow, A, these coaches know what they're talking about, and B, they're doing a really good job of relaying the message to the players because the players clearly understand, like, why was Texas so good at scoring defensive touchdowns last year? And I talked to Chris Nelson about this at, mm-hmm. at Big 12 Media Days. It's because of how they run pursuit drill. Yeah. And, you know, the way Texas runs pursuit drill, it's, you know, it used to be like, hey, they pitch the ball to somebody, everybody go to, like, a point, whether it's cones lined up yeah. or you get to a certain point. The way Texas does it, it's – you start that way, but then the ball gets thrown up to somebody on the back, and they intercept, and then the other ten guys have to turn and mimic finding somebody to block. Yeah, that's why some of those returns late in the year. That's why it looked like it was second nature to guys. And I was talking to Chris Nelson about the attention to detail of the staff. Does he remember one of the first practices they had in Tom Herman's first spring uh, when they were running pursuit drill? I think the second team defense ran through it seven or eight times. Yeah, because they weren't doing it, it right. right. Yeah. and the coach was like, "Hey, we will sit out here and do this our entire practice time until you guys get it right." Yeah. And they finally realized, yeah, we probably need to do it until we and just go ahead and get it right because they mean business. And at U of H, they were good at return touchdowns too. Right. So it's a, a, the, it's a theme, yeah. A lot of the question. time you always thought about being turnovers were luck and chance or returns. You can't predict those type of things or you can't. And it's like, well, no, if you actually are practicing the pursuit drills, what decides football more than anything? Non-offensive scores. You have non-offensive scores. So the idea to invest time to have that to be as efficient of a unit as any is actually really good. But the other thing I see, Rob, this defense, this defensive staff work on a lot, and it's D line to linebackers to both units in the secondary. They work across the bow tackling a lot. Yeah, yeah, and tackling in space a lot, and how to come to balance in space and break down and not be over your toes. Like Heard it's just very physical practices well, compared like, to what we had seen that, before. Well, that hidden yardage. I mean, think about how good they were on fourth down this year. Right, one of the best teams in the country on fourth down. And if they weren't such a sure tackling team, how many of those potential fourth downs would if it had either been converted or would end up being converted as third downs anyway? Yeah. Like it was it, it was really tight a couple of times on some of those Houghton Hill tackles. Right. All right, on a pass. So it really is. It's kind of it is goes back to being a game of inches. Like that's why they were so sound and good on third and fourth downs. They gave themselves another chance with sure tackling. And that was one of the biggest complaints about you know the prior the previous eras. It was like downfall. Yeah. With some of the basic fundamentals, like right. when Manny Diaz had his second year drop off, and so did Manny Befford. So sorry, Manny Befford. Manny <laughs> Befford. We're Manny combining Befford. bad that was, that was a decade. Of, yeah, I was forgetting about <laughs> Manny, Manny Bedford days. Manny Bedford. But it just so shows five you, years of my life. I want back. This defense is going to be steep. Fancy this Diaz. defense. This defense is going to be <laughs> steep. Charlie in. Brown. This defense like is going to be steeped in fundamentals and technique above That's all Charlie else. Brown's and, again, I know that sounds cliche, but when you see it at practice and you see that carry over to the field, 
that's what I hang my hat on with this defense being really good. I know I know it goes back to something you talk about all the time, Rod, to, to be really good on defense. That's where you've got to have players. You've got to have dogs talent. on defense. But you also, as we've seen in this program, you've got to be able to put that talent in the right place. Got to be able to coach that talent to, to do what they need to do within your scheme or coach them. Coach them to be fundamentally sound. And last year, we saw what you get when you take really talented players who you coach to be fundamentally sound, and they've retained the material, which means you're really good at teaching it. That's when you get a defense that changes games. No, I can't. Yeah. I can't wait to see what Todd Orlando has in store. I got a lot of faith in him too. But he, I mean, there, there's some. Like, I want to know how he's going to, you know, use all the pass rushers that he has, maximize those guys because that's going to be, I think, a question mark for him. And how do you utilize the dime package now and the lightning package that was so successful last year and do both of those things? And I'm not simultaneously, but basically do them in a flu- fluid fashion. Because I think Breck and Hager, Charles and Minhu, and and you know um, Malcolm Roach have to be on the field, man, a ton. I think you got to mm-hmm. keep those guys on the field. Like those guys are difference makers for you up front. And then you have Chris Nelson, who you hope. And I think that's kind of the third question: How do you deal with the loss of Puna Ford with just Chris Nelson? Is he is he that much of a difference maker? Because Puna Ford last year certainly was, and that's one guy that may be the most indispensable or irreplaceable force from last year that you got to figure out some way to replace. Yeah. Those are my three questions that I have for Todd Lando, but I think he can answer all of them. Yeah, so, because that was the pivot spot of the defense was Puna, but when you look at this defense just in context to the rest of the country, like you look at college football, just teams, opponent yards per play, so your defense, what they're allowing per play, pretty – Great indicator of not only a good team, but a good defense. But overall, just look at number one, Alabama, 3-9. Number two, Clemson, 4.1. Pretty consensus right there. Then you have some Big Ten teams, Wisconsin, Ohio State, Michigan. Then you got Georgia right there at seven. So three of your four teams that were in the playoff right there in the top seven. We can all say consensus top defenses in the country. You look at the Big 12. The culture of the Big 12 puts Texas clearly number one, Texas and TCU, Leaps and bounds above everybody else. Texas was at 32 in the country at five yards per play. TCU right behind them at 5.1. You look at Oklahoma just to show how great that offense was with Baker Mayfield running with Lincoln Riley. Overcame being 76th in the country because in the Big 12, they were just an average defense in a really good offensive conference. They just were able to survive with offense and be able to outperform because you look at the other teams, the Bama, Clemson, Georgia, had to be top defenses in the nation to perform well. So, you know, as we would indicate, Texas and TCU are the best. We saw Iowa State. We, they were pretty good last year, exceeding expectations. Everybody else down in the 80s or 100s outside below Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. So Texas was clearly the best in the conference. It's just the conference is going to be really tough to stop anybody. So yeah. I want to get into some of this Herb Hand stuff in the time we've got left. And, Rod, we talked about offensive line. We talked about the watch list stuff with Patrick Vahe being on the Outlet Trophy watch list, Zach Shackelford on the Remington Trophy watch list. And that stuff, it's not that big a deal because it's so many guys There's on so the many watch guys list. On it, man. But I think what it speaks to is, if you're a Texas fan looking at this offensive line, to me, that's where it's got to start. If this offensive line is going to improve, that to me is where you need your two veteran guys, one that started 31 games, another one that started 17 games in this program, to play like multi-year starters, like veterans of that ilk, you would expect them to to perform. Yeah, like they, we've seen them both do things really well. We've seen them both do things not so well, but they gotta reach a certain baseline, a certain standard for this offensive line if they want to have any hope of improving. I think it starts with those two guys up front, and part of that is gonna be what Herb Hands brought to the table in terms of how Texas is gonna have an identity in the run game, and really. I know coaches talk about this all the time. The stuff Herb Hand's talking about, it's not like outside-the-box concepts, right? It's still football, still all about basic stuff. It's just like we talk about all the time. Football is a simple game made overcomplicated by simple men. Great quote. But basically what Texas wants to have their run game, the two things they want to hang their hat on is they want to be a team that can run both the inside zone, which everybody in the country wants to run inside zone, regardless of whether you're – Yeah, which regardless of what what style of offense you're running – and they want to be able to run gap and power stuff, which is, you know, your pin and pull concepts and getting your H-backs involved and, and moving across formations and all that fun stuff. And where Herb Hand is going to help, help this offensive line, Rod, I think, is a lot of this stuff, it's going to be all about combo blocks. 
combo blocks, combo blocks, combo blocks. That double team is going to really be a staple of what you see this Texas offensive line do. And and that, to me, helps form an identity because we haven't really seen that from a Texas offensive line. It's just been kind of a mishmash. And that's what I, where I felt the staff fell short last year, which is, okay, can you pin down one or two things, maybe even one. If there's one concept, this offensive line as a group can block well. Then just go with that. And if if that team stops mm-hmm. it, then you know, oh well, you're screwed anyway. Yeah. But I don't think it felt like they didn't really do that last year. And Tom Herman's kind of admitted they didn't do a really good job of adjusting to some of the personnel changes. They hadn't looked. Some of the stuff you lose Connor Williams, you're you're kind of screwed anyway. Yeah. Like I said, but just trying to make up for those advantages you no longer have. But anyway. That's what I think Herb Hand is going to bring to the table. Is they're going to get really good at we, – we want to be really good at doing one thing, and we want to get really good at how we handle double teams. And a term that I think – I don't know if we'll hear from Herb Hand in the media availability, but the term that he throws out a lot is vertical displacement of the down defender. All right. Which, again, sounds simple, but if it was so simple, why didn't everybody think this way? Basically, when you talk about run game concepts – you have to block down linemen first. Like everybody gets kind of said, well, what do you do at second level? What are you doing on the backside? Yeah. Look, if you don't block, if you want to run your play on the front side A gap and you don't move the guy out of the front side A gap, that play's not going to work. Doesn't yeah. matter how good your back is or whatever else you got going on. If you don't move that guy out of the way, it's not going to work. And his theory is look, if we take care of the, da- if nothing else, if you're taking care of the down defenders, you're going to get at least two or three yards. You yeah. won't have TFLs mm-hmm. and, and negative yards played. You can at least stay, the chains. stay somewhat on schedule. Yeah. Yes. So I love that. And he's got different techniques that he that he coaches, whether you're running zone schemes or whether you're running gap power stuff in terms of are you hip-to-hip with a guy on a combo block? Are you knee-to-knee knee knee with a guy on a combo block and different things like that? I won't get into the nitty-gritty details, but Rod, again, some of those things like when Todd Orlando's breaking down defenses and how he looks at his blitz concepts is, hey, we're just going to study patterns like we're, we're wide receivers looking at how they run their patterns. It's not yeah. necessarily pattern matching, but you know, that's how we're going to coach our guys. We're going to coach our guys to understand coverage rules, to make it simple, mm-hmm. to where you're not having to, you know, well, is he number two or number three? No, this is where you're reading at all times regardless yeah. of, of what they're doing. No doubt. It's above all else, we're going to – we're and one of the rules, and I love what he said because I think some O-line coaches missed the boat on this – Never pass up color, which is if you're a pulling guard and your job is to block the play side linebacker, don't pass up that end that that was somebody yeah, was supposed to kick out, out that, that, that caved down. Yeah. Like block that, guy, that guy and move him out of the way because again, at least get the nearest threat. Right, at least you can get two or three yards and yeah. it's not getting blown up in the backfield. So some common sense stuff. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like, and it's good to hear that. Okay, this stuff is being preached to players. So. And and another thing that I love that he threw out there, and something that O line coaches lose sight of, finish your play on a man. Don't finish on air. Don't finish on the ground. Finish your play on a man. And when the whistle blows, you should be engaged with somebody. You should be engaged with somebody. Yeah. Don't don't waste it. The waste yeah. the numbers. Yeah. So and all this stuff, I'm kind of going all over the board here, but some no, of these simple rules, it's, it's simple it's like, stuff. Yeah. It's like well. Why haven't I heard this stuff being preached before? Because it sounds so dang simple. Maybe you, I'm sure you have heard it. And like I said, everybody is teaching the same thing. They're just teaching it a different way. And the terminology is different and their language is different. But it's all the same stuff. He just may have a better, a a language that the guys are more receptive to um, and a better way of teaching it, which is just as important actually as the message these days. Uh, so, yeah, I think he just he's one of those guys that just kind of knows how to lay it out in a simplistic form that's easy to absorb for the guys. And then add on, it sounds as if a very important aspect is almost like a religion for his offensive line is not allowing anything negative. I mean, you need to get in your job done up front because, it's like you were saying, staying on schedule is so key that if you don't, if you just have that one, we always talk about just one or two craters in one part, it will be exploited constantly. And if you have negative plays, not only is it going to go and keep you from mm-hmm. staying on schedule, but now it totally changes your whole mentality, what you have to do. And now the offense almost becomes defensive and the de- defense can become offensive because you're predictable. So just totally preventing any type of negatives to at least be average, at least get that two or three. And then we always talk about the offensive line yards, how those 
five yards are given to the offensive line. If Texas can maximize that, then those highlight yards are the ones that second level yards that are the opportunity. And once you can start to get those, if we're talking about guys that can win one on one battles, that's the Big 12 conference. Rod, you mm-hmm. talked about putting it in simple terms and, and making it relatable for players. You, you talked about the best coaches you've been around. That's what they do well. He's good teachers. And Herb Hand used a kind of a schoolhouse rock analogy. He said three is the number. Basically, everything he teaches is going to be in groups of three. Mm. And I'll give you guys some examples. He said, you know, players, offensive linemen, as they develop uh, the kind of the progression of offensive linemen, you've got who to players, how to players, and why players. When offensive linemen come in, all they're focused on is who do I have to block. Who's my guy? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the next step you've got to get him to is how do I do my job? And that's when you're talking about hat placement, hand placement, footwork, all kind of the finer details. And then the last thing is more so on the coaches, they're going to start to ask why. Why are we doing it this way? And I love it because this really made me feel like Tom Herman made a good hire because I think a lot of the guys on the staff are like this. He said you have to know, you have to be ready to explain why because – players now especially college players mm-hmm. it's not old school where you can't rely on well it's that way because i said so exactly well because you're yeah. trying to have the, put together that, the overall puzzle on right. it, and you were saying it before how the guys understanding the responsibilities and it's like if you have everybody knowing your job and what jobs are to be done then whenever you're in the chaos and are put in an unpredictable situation you aren't then having to process and think it's something that almost has became yeah. a second nature because you know what you're what the overall objective of the plays instead of oh no i'm just supposed to do this and it's 11 unconnected parts doing 11 assignments that don't understand the overall ideology of the play but talk, talking mm-hmm. to guys that played for joe wickline rod like that was to me where the joe wickline disconnect mm-hmm. was was the why part it's well just just do it why aren't you guys doing it just do it yeah and, like, uh, and then, yeah then he wouldn't want to explain it and then there is now frustration well because He's frustrated because why they're asking me this. Are you and they are me? frustrated because he's not doing it. And now there's tension between the player and the coach. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it, aside from the miscommunication or right. the lack of communication, it's like, I'm yeah. not challenging you. I just would like to know. So I yeah. will know. It's that simple. But sometimes people don't take it always that way. Yeah. Um, I also uh, I also really like some of the stuff Herb Hand grouped together. Like every offensive line coach, Rod, you've heard him talk about feet, hands, and hat. That's what you got to <laughs> yeah. have when you're playing offensive line. Herb Hand added three that I've never really heard group together i'm sure i have but not in this like you said all line coaches are different Mm -hmm. they just have different ways of explaining he said the other three important things that he teaches he likes to drive on offense alignment strike strain and finish strike it's pretty self-explanatory come off the football strain it's moving a defender against his will you got to strain a little bit move him yeah and and then finish which like we talked about don't finish your play on a man don't finish on the ground or, or on air finish on the man and that's really the essence so when you combine those three things strike strain and finish that's really the essence of o-line play yeah at its core again it's like simple stuff but well he's I mean, uh, he, he studied teaching the game you can tell you know what i mean because he can explain and explain it to you and explain it to other guys and mm-hmm. he seems to not only be used to doing it but like he's used to giving like these that's why it's good for these coaches to go give these coaching clinics and like basically become a public speaker. It's like a hobby. Because they need to be able to – you have to be able to teach it. If you just know it, it's not good enough. You have to be able to teach it. And that's that to me says that he's at this point in his career, and all coaches I'm sure will get there, but he's a really supreme teacher of the game. Like all that stuff seems really simple and easy, you know, to absorb and easy to identify with. Um. I'm trying to think if there's anything else because I don't, I don't want to get into something that we don't really have time to get into this week. But actually, I do want to get to uh, get to this thing. <clears throat> but Rod, you talk about teaching. Uh, when you look at Herb Hand uh, early in his coaching career, his first few years when he was a coaching at lower levels, he was a defensive guy. He played yeah. O line in college, but he was a defensive guy. So I think that oh no doubt that's an underrated aspect of being an O line coach is understanding. Tom Herman talked about that why he hired Todd Orlando he said I looked at it from a play caller's perspective on offense like what is the hardest stuff to plan for Agreed. what is the hardest stuff to adjust to so I think Herb Hand and he talked about that in his lecture like being a defensive guy first that helped him like okay what are things that as a D-line coach when you saw guys do techniques or whatever what is stuff that's really really hard to coach guys to do what stuff that's really really hard to prepare for 
in terms of good old line play. That, yeah, that just gives you. And I, I like having that different perspective. Does he but. have any special teams experience? Look at his back. Actually, no, I didn't look at his back. Con- Concord right. College, 1997 and 98. Oh, defensive yeah. defensive yeah. coordinator and special teams. He's, he's a college guy. Uh, well, no, but he's an old, his high school football IQ is really high. You can tell that. Yeah. yeah. You can go on both sides of the ball. And, you, and when you got that D, it's like a lawyer, right? If you're going to hire a, a lawyer to defend you, you want a lawyer that's also been a prosecutor. Hmm. You want the guy that's been on both sides of the ass. Because he exactly he knows how they're going to attack attack you and try to. Yeah, yeah. I just want to get to this just real quick, guys, because I know we're we're kind of running out of time, and I I want to definitely hit this the next time. By the way, no show next week. Rod's going to be on vacation. Yeah, I got to go on vacation. I'm actually I'm actually filling in on the Rodcast from one to three. This is true. uh, Next week for Rod on Wednesday, so no show next week. uh, But we'll be back the week after. We'll pick up some of the stuff. But really. Kind of, kind of back, leave everybody on, on these right. things. Hope so. uh, Herb Hand talked about, <laughs> <Of course. laughs> and again, it sounds simple, but it's areas where you see why the Texas offensive struggled last year. Three ways to take control of a game: convert on third down. Texas was, I think, a hundredth in the country on third down offense last year. Score touchdowns in the red zone. Texas was, I think, 80th nationally yeah. or 90 something nationally in yeah. red zone offense, and create explosive plays, which we talked about last year. Didn't do nearly enough of Mm-mm. last year. That's three ways to take control of the game. So, really, in essence, the 2017 Texas offense probably very rarely, that's why we rarely saw them take control of games. They can, they get, they get so much room for improvement, though. It's just hard to think yeah. they won't be better than that because they were so bad in so many different areas, as you just yeah. presented. And three ways to get beat. How many times have we seen these in games where Texas lost? Turn the ball over, overs. allow a lot of TFLs and sacks, and penalties. Yeah, things that get you beat, things yeah. that you can correct that get you beat. Yeah, happened a Again. lot with a freshman quarterback with a bad offensive line. <laughs> it sounds so simple, but yeah, those last three things, those are things that don't take a lot of effort, Rod, to correct. Yeah, but the thing about it, I, I guess I have hope because I saw them sparingly. I, they they were more consistent. Those things that beat you on the Charlie Strong, they were inconsistent, frustratingly so last year. Right, Maryland, Texas Tech. You know, and then you saw him against Oklahoma State, but not the entire game. We just saw it right. when the game was on the line. Oklahoma, <laughs> Oklahoma. You know what I mean? It's like, oh. But so I, but I, I so I have faith that it's gonna get better. That was just the beginning of it. Like eliminate those turnovers, eliminate turnovers, and eliminate turnovers and, and conversions on critical downs against USC. With just those negative. That game plays. probably doesn't get the overtime. Start with the negative plays, yeah. man, yeah. and the pressures. And that's where the Connor yeah. Williams injury that game really just flipped the whole season. Everything changed after that. But even so. I think Texas is like one for five in the red zone yeah. against USC. Yeah, you got to cash game. in, especially when you don't have it. You don't get down there very often, right. which Texas didn't. So. Anyway, that's going to do it for this week's show. Again, no show next week. We'll could pick up this Herb Hand conversation when we, we when we reconvene, if I can talk right today. And like that. we will have that's camp to talk about because practice starts on August 3rd. So next week, camp starts, and the week after, we'll have some camp stuff to talk about. So. Football, baby. Yes, we're yeah. back. Matt, Thomas. thanks for everything, man. You're more than welcome. Rod B., appreciate the time and the knowledge. Anytime, my man. For Matt, for Rod, for Travis, the best damn videographer in the podcast game. For everybody at the Austin Radio Network, 104.9 The Horn, hornfm.com, worldwide on the Horn app, where you can hear Rod B. each and every weekday on the Rodcast from 1 to 3. Famous plug. And thanks to Matt, you get our archives on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page and anywhere you find your podcasts. Yep, type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I am Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.